Hi there, come on in, I'm Fred Trost, and you know deer season is approaching people all over the state, right from the top of northern Michigan to the bottom of southern Michigan are getting ready for deer season, but there's another animal that's all over the state which is hunted very widely an awful lot like deer, and that's squirrel. We have with us Shirley the Squirrel, an eight-year-old gray squirrel, along with Glenn Dutter and Marie Smith, who own Shirley. We're gonna talk about squirrels, squirrel hunting, a great squirrel recipe, and a lot more, so you stay tuned. It's Thursday night, time for Michigan Outdoors. From the rugged shore and woodlands of the north, it's history of copper mines and iron ore, the Great Lakes fishery. Here she is, a little bit nervous, Shirley the gray squirrel. We have two basic species of squirrels in Michigan, Glen. We have the gray squirrel right here, totally gray, and of course our more reddish fox squirrel. Yeah, the two, the two big tree squirrels, the ones that, uh, the largest ones that weigh, you know, over a pound or, or two pounds for the fox squirrel. Now, Marie Smith from Gregory has Shirley, would you name, you just call her squirrel? Yeah, we just call her squirrel because Shirley, I don't know, it just didn't fit her too well. It's just her. <laughs> Starting off name there. <laughs> but she is female. When did you get, acquire her? Oh, I got her eight years ago in May. She was just about two weeks old when I got her. Her eyes was just barely coming open. Well, how, uh, fall out of a nest or what? Well, uh, there had been a real bad windstorm and rainstorm, and I guess the, the nest fell apart or something. Mm -hmm. Cause this and... But eight-year-old squirrel, Glenn, that's almost a record. Well, right? that's the oldest that, that record that I know of squirrels that live in the wild. You know, the average lifespan is less than two years in a while. Mm -hmm. For captive squirrels, uh, eight years is, is getting up there, but not as old as they will be. Okay, would they eat all kinds of nuts? Most every kind. You know, there's some what, kinds. What's their favorite here? Oh, mm -hmm. her favorite is the hazelnut right there, the one. That one? Okay, right well, there. let me see if she's calmed down enough and I can put a hazelnut. Hey, Shirley. You hungry? Ah. Oh. <laughs> She sure does like those. D does she those do everything in the cage that, that uh, squirrels normally do in the wild? Yes. Does she bury them? or? It, it's just really surprising. You watch a squirrel on the um, outside, and uh, they're doing everything, you know, by burying their nuts. Mm -hmm. and, but where she don't have no real big place to do it, she has to put her nuts in her. Here? Yeah, that's where she hides all of her acorns and walnuts, anything she can get a hold of, even her candy bars that she takes. Candy bars? Huh? Has she, have you ever let her out? Yeah, she ran loose in the house for two years there before. But not outside? No, well, she'd been outdoors before, but she'd mm. come back and climb on the screen. I'll and notice done. how she's like the world's wild squirrel. It takes her a while to make up her mind whether mm -hmm. she's going to eat it or bury it. But you know, all her nervousness. Let's take a look at some tape here, Glenn, of a fox squirrel, a uh, wild fox squirrel. And of course, we see these all around suburbs, uh, schools, campuses. Uh, urban areas, fox squirrels seem to prefer. Oh yeah, these are city squirrels where you have wood lots or, or wooded residential areas and that, that foxy orange color in the tail and, and even on the body, depending, uh, there's a lot of color variations that mm -hmm. give away that this is the, the fox squirrel as opposed to the smoky gray of this gray squirrel. Now a fox squirrel, uh, many people think they're cute, maybe they're like a footy tat, something <laughs> like that. They are bushy-tailed rat. Oh Look yeah. The similarity, watch the way they move. They're a rodent. You bet. Bushy-tailed rat, tree squirrel, you know, bushy-tailed tree rat, if you will. And, you know, you see the typical behavior of the fox squirrel searching through the, the leaf litter on the ground looking for whatever, well, <laughs> looking for a nut like that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and there that squirrel goes to bury it. Oh, well, notice how that squirrel's doing the same thing that uh, Shirley here in the cage was. Maybe eat it, maybe bury it. You, squirrely is a squirrel. Mm -hmm. the, they're alert, they're, they're movement, they're, they're, they're quick, but... Uh, uh, so, by our standards, indecisive in a lot of ways. Of course, the reason that we're talking about squirrels is that, is that squirrel hunting is very popular in Michigan. Squirrel meat, despite, of course, maybe we'll turn some people off when they really get thinking about the fact that they are a rodent, <laughs> a rat. Uh, it is just about the tastiest wild meat going, much like chicken. Shirley, when was the last time you ate wild squirrel? Oh, I'm not Shirley. <laughs> I mean, uh, Marie, when was the last time you ate wild squirrel? Oh, uh, see, about two years ago, I did. Uh, now, there was a friend of mine got a couple squirrels, and he asked me if I wanted some. And, you know, I had to keep my back turned to her all the time that I ate some of it. But I love squirrel gravy and biscuits. It's delicious. And you used to hunt squirrels? Yeah, I did. Before Shirley? Yeah, long before her. And when I got her, I just couldn't see to go out and shoot them poor little boogers. They're too cute. Yeah, but you do deer hunt. Yeah, but I never shot one, you know. Of course, uh, until you get a pet deer. <laughs> well, that's what I'm still waiting for. Yeah, well, you know, while the squirrel is uh, running around in the woods, sure, uh, Shirley here in the cage is running around and eating just like that one is doing. They're, they're very nervous, Glenn. Oh, yeah, listen, if you were fed on by eagles and, and hawks and owls and martins, and look, there's burying the squirrel. You see, they're burying that nut. It, uh, 
Well, no, didn't like that place, so try another place. What was the matter with that place? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if the squirrel knows either. But they do try often many places before they find it. There it goes. Now it's going to mm -hmm. tamp the their earth down with its nose. Now, now when it's busy like that, it's not really watching behind no, it. No, it's not. And that's when a fox or a weasel or or uh, some other predator, a martin or fisher further north could, could pick it off. But you know, these, these guys have to be alert, they have to be quick, or they end up with a meal for an awful lot of different kinds of predators. And Notice it didn't like that nut, perhaps uh, because it was rotten or never developed, and go on and find another one. You know, these, these guys are the original the tree planters. Uh, it's a good reason to believe that many of the, the walnut trees, the oak mm -hmm. trees, the hickory trees were planted by these squirrels and uh, the squirrel either was killed and, or, or forgot the location for some reason, didn't find the nut. Of course, one reason why squirrels are so prevalent in urban areas <laughs> is that we don't have a lot of hawks, owls, foxes, and the predators in those areas, so they aren't quite as yeah. right. hassled. Right, and, and this is one reason why you'll get an abundance in urban areas of squirrels that just don't survive in the world, like uh, white squirrels in some mm -hmm. cities can be very, very common. There's a typical feeding position, hanging from the hind feet and the feeding head down. The other way is, of course, like we've seen Shirley do here, sitting up on her haunches and, and, and feeding. Sharp back claws in order to hang that. Why, why would they hang that way, as, as opposed to going up on a limb? Uh, a convenient way, well, I, I really don't know. You it's know, comfortable to swallow up like that, I guess. And perhaps to drop the, the debris downward. Now here's Bob Garner behind that tree, trying to get the squirrel to play a game with him, and fox squirrels tend to run on the ground. They are not creatures of the trees like gray squirrels right. are. You notice how the squirrel still tried to keep the tree between Bob and itself, but it wasn't about to run up that big tree, and that may be because it wasn't that wasn't that squirrel's tree. Squirrels have a social hierarchy, and that may have been the boss squirrel's tree. <laughs> and they would fight. Of course, you hear oh, squirrels fighting and chattering. Because there are so many in the wild, um, they mark their areas, too, where they're at, yes. too. She did this in the house. She marked off the coffee table and the stand tables. That, that was her area, you know, and she didn't allow the dogs to get in that area. Hmm. So she gets along okay with the dogs? Oh, she sort used of. to, sort of. <laughs> Well, here's some good squirrel cover in southern Michigan with a cornfield. Oh, the fox squirrels love the corn, and they're creatures of the ground, and oftentimes when you're hunting them, you should look towards the ground. Now, up in the northern areas with the acorns, uh, you find the gray squirrels in the trees, and looking to the trees is a really a better way to find them because they prefer to run from limb to limb. Yeah, right. Much more arboreal than the fox there's, squirrel. There's two ways that Bob Garner is going to illustrate going about hunting squirrels. Uh, last year, we hunted them with dogs. Uh, this year, he's taking two methods. One is stalking. In deer hunting, this would be still hunting, moving through the woods. Now, this is a difficult way to go because those squirrels uh, are moving all the time and they're looking, they're watching for predators, and if they see you coming, they'll get on the other side of the tree. Still, there are, I bet we have some hot dogs in the audience right now listening, Lynn, and say, hey, I can do it. But they are very skilled hunters. They'd probably be very good deer hunters, too. What I'm always surprised at is in areas where the squirrel population is known through study, how you can be in that area for a long time and not see any mm -hmm. squirrels when, when maybe you've got six, eight, ten squirrels per acre. There's a nest, a squirrel nest, which a lot of people see in the trees in the winter. People don't realize that many, many squirrels die because they do not hibernate. They have to go down and dig nuts up, things they've buried if the ground is frozen. No, oh, but you bet they, they're cut off from their food supply, particularly those buried nuts. And when you don't have the energy and, and perhaps you don't have a tree den, you're forced to live out the winter in a leaf nest, a uh, severe winter storm could end it for an now, animal. Now, if we have a mild winter and a lot of these squirrels, squirrels, by the way, will have six to eight young per litter and have oftentimes two litters per year. So one female squirrel can produce up to 16 babies a year. That's why they're in the rodent family. They are food for many predators. Hunting squirrels really doesn't affect the population because 80% uh, of them don't make it through the year. What happens if they do make it through the winter, though, Glenn, in the spring? Well, if there's a lot of squirrels, uh, one of the first things that will knock a squirrel population is mange. And people often see this in their backyards. Why is my squirrel losing its hair? And if that doesn't get it and you got a lot of squirrels, then there's a, a shock-type syndrome that develops. And with gray squirrels, if you really got a lot of them, they'll pick up and move in mass migration like lemmings. Hmm. Interesting. The squirrel animals that populate and repopulate so much like squirrels aren't really understood by people. And here Bob is using another technique of hunting them where he sits and lets the squirrels do the moving, which is... Nap time. <laughs> you know, which, yeah. Up, up in the tree there. But this squirrel... <clears throat> is destined for a very tough life, all squirrels are, uh, with the 
mortality at 80% in nature with or without hunting. Of course, we feel that uh, hunters who go out and take squirrels for the purposes of bringing them home and eating them, which many, many people do, uh, that is harvesting this resource and using it in a manner that is beneficial to man. Do you like squirrels to eat? Well, they are tasty, but I just say I don't like them anymore. Anymore. <laughs> but you would if you didn't have one for a pet. Well, having a pet squirrel requires a permit. Hunting squirrels requires a license. And you're doing no harm to the squirrel population. We have a tasty recipe coming up. This is just another facet of the hunting world in Michigan Outdoors. Squirrel hunting is the one activity in the woods that is most like deer hunting, and I think there's a lot of interest in both of these right now. I have on the phone Bill Swag. We're going to open up our trophy book on a big fish that was caught last year on November 1st from Lake Charlevoix. Don Perro from Charlevoix was casting a little Cleo. He caught this brown trout, 23 and a half pounds, 32 inches long. Well, you can see why they call those football browns. And walleye that are caught, well, coming up this weekend, it would be one year ago this weekend, Harry Ramsey, uh, fishing in Holloway Reservoir with a jig and minnow, caught this 28-inch, 8-pound, 4-ounce walleye. Some good eating there. When I was at our deer hunters workshop up in Marquette, R.A. Kenyon came up with a picture of fish that really falls a little bit short of our trophy book, but look at this. He's from the UP, from the Air Force Base up there, fishing in East Bass Lake this June. He caught an 18-pound, 1-ounce tiger muskie, 42 inches long. He caught that on 4-pound test line. That just might qualify for a world record. And looking at some bears that came from the UP, here's Rod Hagler and Paul Macadon from Lennon. They got their bears on opening day with a bow, 170 pounds each, and Julie Hagler, Rod's wife, says, hey, that provided us with a lot of good meat. <laughs> That's for sure. Speaking of some good meat, here's a buck, 10-pointer, 180 pounds, uh, got by Matt Karen from Gregory. He's only 17 years old, but on the 23rd of October, he was out there with his bow. Look at the long tines on that buck. William Nurmi from Jackson not only got a buck that had a good rack, look at the size of it. Believe it or not, this buck is 244 and a half pounds dressed out. He's from Jackson, got it around his hometown somewhere. That eight pointer had a 16 and 5 eighths inch rack. We add the eight points with 16 and 5 eighths inches. We have 24 and 5 eighths just above the qualifying 24 we need for our Stroh's Big Buck contest. And actually, he's the first one who has sent in a picture who qualifies for sure. So we are not only going to put him in our Michigan Outdoors trophy book, but he's going to be our Michigan Outdoors Big Buck Hunter of the Week. Ballot box to the mailbox, Ed. Mm -hmm, yes, from Tom a Tim Anderson of Fostoria. Can you have a slug or two with you if you are hunting small game just in case you see a fox? Just in case, huh? Well, Bob, what's the okay, ruling? Okay, just in case, uh, no. You, if, it's five, if it's five days prior to gun deer season, you cannot have it. And if it's during the gun deer season and you do not have a gun deer license, you cannot have it. But yes, you can have it any other time you're hunting small game legally uh, anywhere in the state of Michigan. What you're going to use it for doesn't make any difference. You have to follow the letter of the law. Okay, another from Harbor Beach. Brian Lemansky asks, if a landowner doesn't have his land posted, is it illegal to shoot game over the fence line, then cross the line to recover the game? Long and short of it is, Brian, if there's a fence line, that's just as good as posting, according to the Trespass Act. Or if it's farmland, if you see crops in the field, or a woodlot adjacent to a farmland. Farmland and adjacent woodlots do not have to be fenced or posted. Those are covered by the Recreational Trespass Act. And you must have written permission in order to hunt those areas. One exception, however, if your dog is lost or strayed and you're trying to locate it, if you were hunting, leave your guns in the car. You can trespass without permission to get that dog, but you cannot have a gun with you. Mm -hmm. Okay, from St. Louis, Alan Monroe asks, is the dividing line for deer hunting with a rifle going to be changed? when and where would the new line be? That's right. He says a lot of people from St. Louis want to know because they've heard about this, Bob. Well, there was there was some talk about moving the line north a little bit, that Muskegon to Bay City line. Uh, that came up in a bill four years ago. Bob Vanderlaan sponsored it. It really never got through the committee, and I don't expect really that line to be changed for a number of years to come. Local rumor, that's all. Okay, and one more from South Lyon. Tim Thefault asks, can you hunt from the shore hidden in, the gr in grass or brush without Hunter Orange? Can you shoot waterfowl when they are on the water? Okay, the first question, <laughs> you can 
uh, you're, it's legal not to wear hunter orange if you're hunting waterfowl from a boat or a blind. Or a blind. Okay, Mr. Conservation Officer, I have these weeds here and I've tromped them down. It's, I'm calling it a blind. Fred, I'll tell you what, I'd want to make sure that some of them were bent over and, and make it a little bit more blindy mm -hmm. looking, but I've been in the same spot, even up the managed areas, you just stand in the corn. Technically, you're supposed to have hunter orange, but nobody really wears it. Okay, that's a judgment call by the conservation officers. Don't be moving and walking because then you need hunter orange. And the question of ground swatting, shooting ducks on the water. Yes, it is legal. Some hunters object to it, say it's more sporting in the air. On the other hand, you're more likely to make a quick clean kill if it's on the water while its body is submerged and only its head is up, but there's a problem of ricochet. So go ahead and do it, especially for chasing cripples, but use judgment about that ricochet as a safety precaution. By the way, all of these questions from the mailbag are in our brand new Club Digest. Now, about the outdoor quiz. The question is, do you know the largest fish ever caught worldwide on a rod and reel? This is what you call a dandy hit. 2,264 pound great white shark that was caught by Alf Dean of Australia in 1959. What do you do with squirrels that you've gotten on a hunt? Well, if you like fried chicken, you'll love Dave Weaver's Southern Baked Squirrel. Oh, that meat just comes right off the bone. Well, this was a simple recipe. This was the same one Bud was telling us about, basically. Basically the same, and, and that's right. And so often, simple recipes are some of the best recipes. And now, the first thing you did was, after quartering it, cutting it up into into the sections is wash it thoroughly. I washed it thoroughly several times to get rid of as much blood as possible, just to clean up the meat and, and uh, like I said, to, um, to uh, get rid of the blood. Mm -hmm. And then it went into the flour. Then to put it in the flour, dust it lightly in the flour, and once it was dusted in the flour, I put it in the pan with some hot grease, about a quarter of an inch of cooking oil. Now, d did you add anything to the flour? No, no, it was just plain flour at that time. You could. Uh, as an alternate, you could season your flour beforehand, mm -hmm. but I prefer to season afterwards. To okay, and you wait till it gets golden brown on one side, flip it flip over. Flip it on the other side, golden brown. And how long does that take? Oh, you have to about five minutes, six minutes, something like that, depending on how hot your grease is. Once I did that and it was brown on each side, then I put it in the uh, pressure cooker, and I cooked it in the pressure cooker with just a little bit of water in the bottom for uh, 20 minutes at 10 pounds. Mm -hmm. And when it came out, this is what you see. And it came out uh, steaming. Now, what, what if you put it in the pressure cooker first and then fried it? Is that possible? Uh, it would be possible, but as you can see, the meat is almost falling off the bone right mm -hmm. now. So if you did that, you would, you would have a tendency to lose some of your meat in the, in the skillet. The other, the other thing is that when you brown it first, dust it in flour and brown it, it puts a coating on the outside and it seals the juices, mm -hmm. which is the flavor, in the meat. Well, you could yeah. probably put a lid on the pan and steam it right in the frying oh, pan. Oh, sure. You know, we that uh, this is the fast way of doing it by putting it in the pressure cooker. But you do exactly mm -hmm. the same thing by leaving it in the skillet and putting a lid on and putting low heat and cooking it that way for an hour or hour and fifteen minutes until it was tender. You know, to me, this tastes like Southern Baked Squirrel, a simple but mighty tasty recipe. All the opening days of all the hunting and fishing seasons of the year, there's none that compares with opening day of firearm deer season, November 15th. Hunters have been psyching up for this for a long time. There's so many facets of it. There's the preparation, the scouting, keeping warm, keeping alert. Of course, one of the most important things to the lucky 125 or 150,000 hunters who get deer is how to care for that deer, how to prepare it, how to butcher it, how to turn it into some tasty succulent venison. Well, we're going to be covering all of those things next week on Michigan Outdoors. We have venison and wild rice stew, a preview of the deer season, everything to get you ready for opening day. So tune in Thursday night next week right here on Michigan Outdoors. Music